So yesterday was a historic day for space travel. 1969, July the 20th, a man walked on the moon for the first time. In a book called Men from Earth, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong wrote about that moment. As the lunar module descended to the surface of the moon, there were readings in the module that indicated they should abort. And he said there was a big red button right in front of them that all they had to do was hit the button and send them back to the, to the mothership. They thought about it. Mission control said, give us a minute. And they said, proceed. It happened twice. And in the book they say, do you know how hard it is to trust somebody you can't see that's 250,000 miles away? But they did. And they made history. Storyline, it's hard to trust somebody you can't see today. And sometimes he feels like he's thousands of miles away. But you're just saying a song that says, he doesn't fail us. You can trust him. And that's the greatest challenge. That's the greatest season in your life when you learn you can trust him. Don't hit a board. It's okay to get mad. I know I'm not the one you wanted to see standing up here this weekend. I'm honored to be here. Every time I get to come to Storyline, I love it. But. Let's be honest, this is a hard time, and I don't know how you feel. I've been doing this for 44 years. I've been on the other side that is the one leaving, and I have been told by those that stayed behind, yeah, it's hard. I've had a lady greet me in her store. Two months after I left, I came back and just dropped in to say hello, and she looked at me in front of customers and everybody and said, where in the blank did you go? You abandoned me. I'm mad at you. And I said, well, I am so glad to see you too. <laughs> it's okay. I had a member come up this morning and said, is it okay to be angry at Ben? Sure it is. Sure it is. You wouldn't be normal if you weren't. Is it okay to be mad at God? Absolutely. Do we understand God? Do we understand how all this works? No. But we trust him. You see, we don't walk by sight. If we can figure it out, we don't need God, right? You are God. If you can figure it all out, we can. So we trust him. And I just believe that it's okay to get those feelings of anger. They'll come, they'll go. Somewhere in the process, you learn to trust. And so today, all I would ask is whatever the emotion, whatever the feeling, don't give up. Don't quit. Don't hit the button. Say, I'm out. Just hang on. History was made yesterday, 50 years ago, because they didn't hit the button. I believe this is a season that will bring you to a great place. And I know you expect me to say this, and, and we, was that the Lord speaking? Because if it was, I really want to hear what he's saying right now. <laughs> it didn't sound like Siri, but... So here's what I will tell you. There's a, there's a book called Revelation. You know it. End of the Bible. Real complicated. I mean, it's got a lot of challenging stuff, but it's got some real simple stuff, too, to the churches. And I'm in a series back in Orlando. The series is called Dear, Dear Church. I mean, it's letters to the seven churches. There is a church named Thyatira because it was in the city of Thyatira. And Jesus says to them, I know your works, and this is what he says, I know your latter works are greater than your former. Now, what does that mean? You're getting better. You're getting better. Let me tell you what I pray for Storyline, what I pray for me. I pray this. It, it's my favorite comment Jesus made to the church. Your latter works are greater than your former. You know what that means? You're getting stronger. And I believe that you're going to look back and see that your latter works are even greater. Yeah, you've had a great start. Yes, God's done phenomenal things, but hey, he's not through. Neither should you be. So today, out of the word, Philippians chapter 3. I just said, God, I just know this word is about continuing 
a race that we've started and, and something that you're not through with us. And so God began to take me to this place. It actually happens to be my life verse, a part of this, and it's something that I live by. So if you've got your Bible or you've got your phone, you can turn it on, you can somehow get there to Philippians chapter 2. And, and if I could just for a few moments tell you, man, I'm so blessed to be here. I love the interim pastor, Jason. I had a chance to meet him one time before, but I love him. I'm, the elders, I've gotten to, to meet them and get to know them better. And your staff, you got great people, and they're making some great adjustments and changes, and you're going to be hearing a lot more. And so remember to pray for them. Remember to encourage them in every way because this is difficult. And remember, there's a big old church in Orlando, Florida that loves you, and today they're praying for you. They're not right now because they're all gone home. <laughs> But I heard it this morning. I watched the stream, and every service, your name was called. Every service, it was, hey, today, pray for Storyline. It's the first weekend after being left. And so it's, it's, it, I just want you to know that. we got brothers and sisters down in Orlando that love you and that are praying for you. I, when I was invited, could not believe. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. When the elders called, I said, yes, I'd love to be there. And then my wife said, what are you thinking See, she knows something that I don't understand, and that's about women giving birth. My daughter-in-law is pregnant, and she's expecting our second grandchild, this one, a little girl. We have a little boy, two and a half, who is our first grandson, first grandchild. And so she's expecting, and she's due July 30th. And my wife said, you know, she tends to go early. She did with the first one. And so you're going to Denver. I said, yes. I just feel like I'm supposed to. I, I'm, I'm telling you, God is telling me, I, I'm, I'm going. I'm going to be there. And she said, okay, you go on Saturday. You come back on Sunday. I said, all right, I'll do that. We'll make a real quick trip. Guess what? My daughter-in-law went into labor Friday morning, <laughs> delivered our granddaughter at 11 o'clock Friday morning, and so everything worked out great. See, the Lord knew what he was doing. He had it all worked out. And I got to be there and hold her and, you know, enjoy the moments, and then I'm out. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed this, guys. And let me tell you the one reason I'm here. It's because I love you. I stood the first time and wept in front of you, the first time I ever spoke to you in that auditorium. I hate to remind you of it, some of you, all the work that you remember in that auditorium, but I stood and I wept in front of you because I believe that you are the plan of God that he has had in mind all along. And so when I come and stand here, it's because I believe God has done something amazing and he is still doing something incredible. And I want to take you to the text that kind of talks about that, okay? This is, a, this is a letter, Philippians, written by the Apostle Paul. He's in prison. Now, this is a cra it's one of my favorite letters, but it's a crazy letter because it starts off with, hey, re rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. He, he talks about being joyful. He's in prison. Can I just tell you, circumstances don't determine the race you're running. Your heart does. Because circumstances change. This is a season of change. Change is a part of our life. I mean, even our bodies, we're, we're changing. My goodness, some of you have gotten older since the first time I saw you. I mean, it happens to all of us, right? It's happening to every one of us. Go home, look in the mirror. Thank God it's as good as it's going to be. You're going to change, every one of us. But it's okay because in the season of change, there's something that doesn't change. I know right now everything's moving here. It's spinning. I don't know. How, how many of you in this room get seasick? Raise your hand. You get seasick or are you even driving even car sick okay of course living in florida one of our favorite things to do is fish and to fish offshore but man i, I fight it now, i can handle i can handle three to four foot waves but when they get five to six that's tough it's really hard my wife she's out she's gone friends of mine they they're dying when it gets to that but here's what i learned a doctor told me he said you know why you get sick because everything's moving if you can find one thing that's not moving, stare at it, and you'll be okay. And he said, out there, the only thing is the horizon. It's not moving. And it's funny, if you've ever been sick, seasick, you're out there and you're dying, you want to die, and so the boat comes back in, and as soon as you can see land, what happens? 
you're fine. Oh, I feel great. Let's go back. No, nope, we're not going back. Why? When you see land, finally you have something that's not moving. Can I just tell you that when you go through a change like you're walking through a transition, everything's moving. Makes you a little sick. But there's one thing that isn't moving. He is not moving. He will not move. He will be here. He will not change. Fix your eyes on him. Keep watching what God is doing around you and how God is working even through this. And you will find stability. And that's exactly what this verse gives us. So I'm reading from chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 verse 12. Not that I have already obtained this or am already made perfect. But I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining toward what lies ahead... I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. May the Lord bless that word in our life. My favorite word in Greek. And I taught Greek, taught New Testament, taught this book at Southwestern Seminary. My favorite word in Greek is the word dioko. That is the transliteration from English to Greek. I mean from Greek to English, dioko. Say it with me, dioko. You spell it D-I-O-K-O. If I ever get a tattoo, it'll be that word, Dioko. I'm real close. My wife is about to give in. (laughs) So I'm real close. Dioko. That's what this is saying, and you're going to learn exactly what he's saying. So here's the idea. Dioko means I'm going after something. I'm running. I'm pursuing something. Now, the first thing that you run into as you read this is, you're not there yet. We are not there yet. It's not over yet. So this is what Paul says. I haven't obtained it. I have not gotten it. I'm not already perfect. So in other words, I'm not through. We're not there yet. Storyline, I'm convinced of this. You are not there yet. God is not through And so what Paul starts off by saying is you have to have a holy discontent in your life. You have to have this sense of there's more. I don't want to miss what God's going to do. I don't want to miss what God wants. Can I just encourage you, this is the time your church needs you. This is not the time to pull back. This is the time to get more involved. For somebody in this room that's never signed up to to do anything, to serve, or to be a part of any of the teams, this is the season. Why? Why? Because you're not through. And it's going to take all of us to move through this and to keep running the race that he's got before us to press on. I used to to bring staff up here. Uh, You know, been coming to to Colorado since the 80s because of mission trips and doing mission work all around the area. And one of the things that I used to do was bring pastors, fellow pastors, staff members up here. We stayed at a camp in Grand Lake. And so what we would do is we'd go up into the park. And hang out up there and do some, you know, climbing and some hiking. And we had, we had one trip. I wanted to go up that mountain, Mount Specimen. It's it's right there over on the western slope. After you go across Trail Ridge and and you drop down and there's the line, the so-called Continental Divide. It's the mountain up to your right, and it's got a big bald uh, place you can get up there, and it's beautiful and grassy. And we had a couple of older staff members, and and we had one from Britain, from England. He was funny. He showed up to go on the hike that day. looked like he was playing the British Open. I mean, he had scotch. I mean, he had cardigan stuff, everything. He had it going, you know. He looked great. But he was a little heavy and not in good shape. So we start up that trail. And, you know, it's got a whole lot of switchbacks. And then it finally straightens out a little bit. But he, he gets tired, and he says, I can't make it. And I said, yes, you can. We're not there yet. He said, I just can't go. Yes, you can. We're not there. We're in the middle of the woods. You can't see anything. I said, just wait. And he said, I don't know if I can do it. I called some pastors over. I said, let's go. Let's do it. And we got behind him, and we started pushing him. 
I mean, we had pictures of this. We started pushing him, and we're pushing him. And John Harris, you guys know him, and we're pushing him, and, and he's trying to quit. And I said, nope, you're not there yet. You had not seen it yet. You're not there yet. Don't you quit. And we finally have a whole bunch of us pushing him, and finally we get up into that opening, and he breaks out of the woods, and he sees it, and he gets a little life in him, and he makes it all the way. And, man, we're up there celebrating. But I remember the whole time just saying, we're not there yet. If I could physically get behind you and I could push you, I would push you and say, hey, we're not there yet. Don't quit. You can't wait to see what's coming. Just don't quit. We're not there yet. That's number one. Number two, we got to keep running. We got to keep running. Paul says, I press on. So what is the word? What's he say? What's he mean? Press on. Dioko. What's that word? Why is it so special to me? Let me tell you. It's because it is a hunting word. Can you believe Paul would actually use a Greek word that even in its day was a hunting term? Here's what it meant. It meant to pursue something with passion. It meant to go after a trophy. And and it was really used in some, some materials outside of the New Testament. We call them extra biblical materials where it was referring to an archer going after a trophy. And so growing up in the outdoors, I mean, I love it. I think, How, that's perfect. It means I'm willing to get up at ungodly hours of the day. I'm willing to go out, subject my body to the cold and to the elements. And my wife called me crazy. And I began to think I am at some moments. But I'm doing it for a reason. Why? Because I'm pursuing something. Ladies, it's like going to the mall and you know there's an item on sale and that's the one you're going after. You've seen it online and they got it at the store. And so you're going to fight through whatever. It could be a Black Friday moment. I mean, it could be whatever that you're pursuing. That's what the word is. And so what he's saying is, I'm not quitting. I'm going to pursue this. And let me tell you why he's pursuing it. He says, because Christ Jesus pursued me. Because Christ Jesus didn't give up on me. Because he apprehended me. Go back to the word. But I press on to make it my own. Verse 12. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Let me tell you the greatest reason to keep running and don't quit. It's not Ben. It's not storyline. It's not me. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't quit on you. He didn't stop. No, he apprehended you. In the Greek text, that is literally the word to arrest you. And you know what Paul was thinking when he wrote that? You know what he was thinking. He was thinking that day on the Damascus Road in Acts 9 when he's on the way to Damascus to deliver letters to arrest Christians, to have them killed. And all of a sudden he sees the light and he's knocked to his knees and he's blinded. And who was it? Jesus. He never forgot that. Have you forgotten the day Jesus saved you? Have you forgotten the day he answered your prayer? Have you forgotten the day he healed your child? Think about the moments where Jesus has been there, where Jesus didn't quit on you, where Jesus was faithful to you. That's what he's saying. He's saying because of that, I'm not going to quit on him. I'm going to press on because Jesus did that for me. I remember the day long before I knew Ben Mandrell, long before I knew any of you. I remember the day three of us from First Baptist Orlando stood on the bluff at five points, at five parks, and we stood there. And prayed and the earth moved. Now some of you know this story. But some of you are new and you don't know. We came up here believing that God wanted us to plant in Denver. All my days I've been working in the area in Aurora and Sade and Littleton and Canyon City and, and Penrose. I mean we've, we've been Pueblo, all of these places. And I knew one day God was going to give me an opportunity to plant a church in Colorado. And so we came to Denver because it was one of the sinned cities. And so here we are. And, and they show us three places. One of them was Stapleton. And I forget what the other one was. And then he said, there's another place out in Nevada. And we're going to go to a little area. It's called Five Parks. And we went there. And we stood on that bluff. And I remember lifting my hands as we were praying. And I remember feeling the ground move. I literally felt it move. I looked over at my wife. And I said, you feel that? And she said, yeah. What an earthquake. It was God moving. And that day, God said, I want a church here. I'm going to birth a church, and I want you guys to be a part of it. We went back. I called Kevin Ezell with North American Mission Board. I said, Kevin, what do we do next, man? We're ready to go. 
and we're ready to plant there. So I want you to tell us what, what, what should be our next step. He said, hey, would you guys mind meet somebody? Because somebody else is also praying. They haven't been there yet, but they're thinking they're going to go to that area. I said, yeah, who is it? Well, his name is Ben Mandrell. I said, well, sure, I'd love to meet him. Ben and I sat and talked. He met our pastors. I said, Ben, would you bring your family to our church in Orlando? Would you stay with us about six months, and then we'll send you out. And we'll send people, great people, and there's some in this room that we sent with him. And he said, I'll do it. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because I'll tell you why there's a church here. It's not because of Ben Mandrell. It's not because of me. It's not because of anything other than God wanted a people here. God wanted to birth a church. You are the reason the church is here. And that hasn't changed. And so I believe God is saying through Paul, we're going to keep going. Why? Because Jesus is still moving. He grabbed hold of our heart, yes. And now we're going to run for him. We're going after this. So Dioko, press on. It means you do two things. Make it real simple. This is exactly what Paul says. And by the way, if you're, if you're into languages, and I've met a couple of guys in seminary, and they love this kind of stuff, two participles that explain what press on means, what dioko means. They're both, if you want to know, circumstantial participles of manner. Now, it doesn't mean anything to our discussion, but if you want to impress your friends and neighbors, you can go tell them you learned that. Here are the two participles. Here's how you press on. Number one. Forgetting what is behind. Number two, straining forward to what is ahead. Simple enough. Number one, forgetting what is behind. Number two, straining toward what is ahead. That's how you press on. Number one, forgetting what is behind. Can you really forget? No. But that's not what the word means. You can't forget days you've had. You can't forget forget incredible moments you've had here. But you know what you can do? You can thank God for them and set them aside and get them out of the way. You can't forget moments in your life you failed, you messed up, but you can set them aside. Let Let me show you. Let me give you an example how important this is. What's the most important thing in your house? Okay, now this, this is not a spiritual question, so I know you think the answer is Bible. This is, this is not a spiritual question, okay? So let's not be spiritual at this moment. All right, what, what is the most important thing in your house, the most important item, whatever? Anybody? Air conditioner. Air conditioner. <laughs> hey, you're speaking my language. In Florida, we wouldn't live there without an air conditioner. All right, somebody else? What's What's that? Well, family, yeah, people, but I'm thinking of something, not a person, inanimate. The front door, what was it back here? Water closet, yes. For some of you who don't know, that's the bathroom. All right. What, what else? Yes, refri- who votes for refrigerator? I'm in there. Yeah, anybody else? A bed, uh, it works. The floor is kind of hard after a while, isn't it? Somebody said in the first service, a coffee maker. Yes. <laughs> what would we do without that? Let me show you. None of you have gotten it. You're going to think, this is crazy. Here's the most important piece of furniture or item in your house. If you didn't have a trash can, you would pile stuff up, and you would be on a show called Hoarders. <laughs> Am I right? I mean, I, my wife loves that. She watches it. I think she thinks I am and I ought to be on that show but anyway that I didn't think about it if you never let go of anything if you never move anything out of the way what do you do you build a house you have a house full of clutter I had a young man come to me and he said I want you to go visit my grandmother with me I said I would love to tell me her story she she has some health issues he didn't warn me we went in a house his nice brick home probably 2,500 square feet Walked in the door. I, I'm, I promise I'm not making this up. We walk in the door, and there was a path just about, just about four feet wide. And on either side of the path to the ceiling, she had eight foot ceilings. Thankfully, she didn't have the big 12 or 16 foot. Eight foot ceilings on either side, stuff. You know those cartons, like a, those little, like a to go, you get a to go plate or something, they put it in the little styrofoam cart. 
oh my goodness, they were piled straight up. Newspapers, magazines, boxes, all kinds of things. And they're just everywhere in her house. You have a little four-foot path. Her kitchen had the same kind of stuff. Down the hall to her bedroom, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, I was shocked. Think about your life and the clutter that you won't let go of. Now, I'm not talking about just the bad stuff, but maybe it is bad stuff. Maybe for some of you, you can't get past your past. You can't get past some of the mistakes and the failures you made. Listen, that's why Jesus died. That's why he was buried and rose again, so your stuff could stay in a grave, and you don't have to carry it the rest of your days. But for some of you, it's the good times. You know what? I believe it's harder to get rid of the good things than the bad things. I think we all want to talk about what we used to be. We all want to look back, oh, well, when I was young, man, I did this. I mean, up here, oh, I climbed every one of those mountains when I was young. I can do it all. And we're always the has-been. We're always what we used to be. But the question is, what are you today? Well, I used to teach. I used to work with the children. I used to read my Bible every day. I used to do this. Well, hey, that's great. Thank you. Let's move it aside. What are you doing today? You see what I'm saying? Storyline, don't be one of those churches that talks about your past. Please don't turn into one of those, oh, man, you should have been here when we... No, 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 no. Move it aside. Forgetting what is behind. The word forget in Greek means literally to move it out of the way. Move it out of the way. Give thanks for it. Yes, awesome, great. We're moving. There's more stuff. There's more things. Let me show you a quote. Do we have the quote by R.T. Kendall? Look, look at this quote by R.T. Kendall. The greatest opposition to what God wants to do are those who are on the edge of what God did last. And I'm begging you and encourage you. Yes, celebrate what he's done, but let, let's get ready for what he's going to do. Press on. D-O-C-O. First thing, set aside the things of the past. Then what's the other side? Straining toward what is ahead. You know that word is, that phrase is never used anywhere else in the New Testament, which they call it a hypox legomena. That is a very important thing, meaning if it's never used anywhere else, then it's got to be something has meaning to Paul. This is a phrase that literally was taken straight out of the Olympics or out of the games. Okay, Paul writing Philippi is on the Greek peninsula. They knew the games. They knew exactly what this was about. Let me show you what the word means, straining for what is ahead. You know, when, a, when you run, anybody in here run track like a, a, a sprinter or a long distance or whatever? Anybody run track? Some of you? Maybe some of you used to? You want to tell us about how great you were at one time? <laughs> how many medals you got? Okay, you know. All right, here's the moment. When you get near the finish line, what do you do? You stretch. Now, if it's a sprint, you really stretch. I mean, you do everything you can. When I, when I was running, it was a tape, literally a tape. Now, electronic. So you stretch. That word that we just read is the word for the stretch. It's the word for putting everything you got into trying to get across that line. And Paul said, you got to do that to press on. So what's the line? We are running to him. We are running to him. And he says there will be a moment when we hear the upward call. We receive the goal. The goal is that upward call, according to Paul. And the upward call then allows us to know we have run the race and we have finished and we have run well. Let me tell you where it comes from the games, as I said. And what the upward call is, is when the announcer, he's called the agonophete in Greek. He's the agonophete. He would be at the Olympics and he would announce the winner. So, for example, if I'm going to award somebody in here today that has won the award, your name would be called and you get up. And you make your way up here. That upward call was something they loved to hear. Because when they heard your name, you know, when your name got called, you got to stand up and go and receive the wreath. And by the way, it was a victor's wreath. It was something that was given to them. So I think what Paul is, is talking about is that, man, when we run our race, when we get to the end, wherever that is for us, we will hear that call. 
and we will know we have finished. And he will present us something. Now, I don't know if it's a crown, a wreath. The Bible uses different language. Don't get hung up in that. There are like five different crowns talked about in the New Testament. Some of them are, are, look like they're a crown. Some of them look like a wreath. The Stephanos is a wreath. Diadem is a crown. But here's what I want you to know. I promise you when you receive that, when you hear that upward call and you get to the goal line, you're not going to look down at that crown and go, you know, Jesus, I was kind of hoping for something more. No. You're going to be blown away because why? Look who's giving it to you. So really the goal is Jesus. The reason I want you to keep running is Jesus. It's not me. It's not storyline. It's not Ben. It's Jesus. Because of what he did for you. And so we are running a race. We're not through storyline. We, we're going to finish this race. And I'll tell you the principle of Africa. Our missionaries tell us. That in Africa, and I've heard it myself, they say this often. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. I want to go far. And I want, I want us to go together. I'm going to show you one of my top three moments in sports history. This moment... Some of you were not even born. You may have heard about it or read about it or seen it. But this was a moment that happened in Barcelona, Spain in 1992. It was the 400-meter race. And the odds were on a young man by the name of Derek Redman, who had broken the British record when he was 19 years of age. And then the unthinkable happened. Watch this. at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Stadium as Redmond, with assistance this time, approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic spirit.
Every time I see that, I just cry. Because the moment that his father would come, put his arm around him, say, let's finish this together. Guys, our father is here. And he is here to pick you up. And to say, yeah, you can finish. It's not over. In fact, it's just getting started. And he runs with us. And not just our Heavenly Father. Sometimes he comes to us with his people. Yeah, if we want to go fast, we go alone. But if we want to go far, we're going together. Guys, I'm here to run with you. First Baptist Orlando is here to run you're not alone. And together we can finish what God started at Storyline. The word dioko is in the present tense, which in Greek means it's continual. You know what that means? Every day you press home. Every day, not just Sundays, every day. It means today we run. Today we press on. Today. We forget what lies behind, and we strain to what God has for us. The song we're going to sing now just simply says we're his sons and daughters. Isn't that awesome? The father, just like Derek's father, beside us, carrying us if he has to. Why? Because we're his son. We're his daughter. And he loves us. What a great reason to never quit. So together, can we stand? Can we just sing this as our testimony? We're going to press on. We're your son, we're your daughter, and we will run for you. Thanks for listening to Storyline's weekly message online. We hope you're blessed and challenged by it. If you'd like to respond to something you heard, please email us at contact at Storyline Fellowship.